The whole world watches whatever the women of the House of Windsor wear. From the Queen to Diana, to Kate and Meghan. Every dress and every gown has always been under enormous scrutiny. It gives you a lift when you see someone in something beautiful like that. Think, oh my God, isn't that wonderful? Tonight, the stories behind some of the royal's most iconic outfits. Diana's clothes put out a message of, well, her mood really. She wore an absolutely knockout black chiffon frock. She called it her revenge dress. What it takes to be a dressmaker by royal appointment. When I saw this on her, I realized that this area was far too complicated. So I refined that to be much, much simpler and have more of an impact. And we lift the veil on the wedding gowns the world fell in love with. I think the longest train in royal history was 20 foot. I said, darling, let's make it bigger. So we had a little giggle about it and we made it 25 foot. Experts reveal the tricks of the royal trade. We used to use a lot of silk for the Queen, which actually you had to be very careful with. If you folded it across the fabric, it was fine. If you folded it the other way, it cracked. And why the Queen is always guaranteed to stand out in the crowd. The Queen's signature style is bold colour and a hat. We certainly noticed that one. You could not escape. There she is. Plus, who are the unsung heroes of royal style? Sophie Cass of Wessex, who's wearing this awesome snakeskins, which you wouldn't really expect a royal to wear, but she totally rocked it. And who have made the most fashion faux pas. Sarah Ferguson was completely lacking in style. These are the stories of the most memorable royal dresses of all time. And the secrets of those who created them. The Queen looked at the bridesmaid dress and said, will it wash? The press office in Buckingham Palace rang me and said, Mr. Emanuel, you're responsible for the gown. Uh, yes. But the world wants to know. Over the years, generations of royal women have developed their own looks. Queen Mary favoured hats and big collars, while the Queen Mother loved chiffon and feathers. Our reigning monarch has kept her eye on fashion for over 65 years, during some very different style eras. As a young princess, a newly crowned queen, to a modern day monarch who is still fashion relevant today. She was and, and is an incredibly good looking woman. She has always been stylish in a kind of very regal sense. The Queen's style has evolved over the years. She's always stepped with the times and she's been dressed by some of the giants in the fashion industry from Hardy Amy's and Norman Hartnell through to Angela Kelly today. I do admire her. She's found this everlasting look stuck to it. Good for her. Even today, the Queen never fails to make the headlines, whatever she's wearing. Memorably, at Kate and William's wedding, she wore bright yellow. Meghan and Harry's wedding, she wore lime green. On her 90th birthday, she wore neon green. She arrived this fluorescent colour. I mean, oh, my God. But you know what? She wanted to have fun. We certainly noticed that one. Obviously, her designer decided to pump it up, and let me tell you one thing. If she didn't like it, she wouldn't wear it. That's for sure. The Queen's 21st century look is bright and bold, but there's a very good reason for it. The Queen is not a very tall woman. She is often in a situation where she is surrounded by people um, and she needs to stand out. The Queen's signature style is clean cut, nothing fussy, and wherever possible, bold colour and a hat. Her Majesty's style is absolutely perfect for what she does. She doesn't walk around wearing a crown, therefore she has to wear bright colours. So out of the crowd of grey or beige, you go, that's her. Clever. The Queen was not always seen in glorious technicolour. Her early fashion statements were captured in black and white, but that didn't stop her creating her own style. I always love looking back at old photographs of the Queen because she was a stunner. It's easy to forget that she was a young woman and she did wear kind of off-the-shoulder dresses and, you know, ball gowns. She had such a tiny waist. I, I'm incredibly envious of her very slim waist. She always looked immaculate. She dressed in that wonderful 50s style of clinched-in waists and wide skirts and high sandals. And she lived in a man's world and she wanted to do everything completely correctly. When she became queen, she had to think carefully about her style and which designers she would wear. 
There is no reason why English fashions should not compete with the famous creations of the dress houses of Paris. One designer the Queen favoured was Norman Hartnell, the darling of the British fashion scene. He was known for his opulent yet dignified designs. It was a very convenient dress for the evening because it had pockets to it, you see? Had a multitude of sins. Norman Hartnell and also Hardy Amis made some beautiful outfits for the Queen. But I think my favourite are her old Hartnell dresses. They hark back to an era of such elegance, such style, and such incredible workmanship. From the very beginning of her reign, the Queen has been a fashion inspiration. Roy Allen has been... I was an apprentice and worked my way up through Hardy Amy's. So I started in 57. Hardy Amy's and Hartnell were the top two fashion houses that made for the Queen. I made clothes for Princess Margaret and Fergie, the Queen Mother, and Usher Cornwall. It gives you a lift when you see someone in something beautiful like that. You think, oh, my God, isn't that wonderful? You know, it, it gives you a lot of pleasure. The royals have many demands upon their wardrobe from walkabouts, to state dinners, to meeting foreign dignitaries. They need to be ready for any occasion. There was so much going on that the royals went to, so we were always making clothes for them. The normal thing was three fittings. I only ever did one. And for everything I make for any of them, I keep a pattern, so I can revert back to those you never stopped making for her in those days. Just stand around for lots of fittings, you know, you didn't really want to do that. So if you get away with one fitting like that, you know, it saved her a lot of aggro, really. In his early days of making clothes for the Queen, Roy couldn't resist a keepsake. The very first thing I worked on when I was an apprentice was a blue coat that she wore to go to Canada. And it had big beaver cuffs on it. When it was fitted and I had to mark up the alteration and everything, the piece I cut off of it, I kept because I thought, oh, the Queen's had this, the Queen's worn this, and I still have it to these this day. <laughs> The Queen works with her designers to create the perfect outfit. Those collaborations often offer an insight into life behind the scenes with the royals. One of her favourite couturiers, Ian Thomas, made this beautiful outfit for her. When he was doing the hem, Prince Philip walked through the Queen's dressing room and said, hmm, nice dress, and a Queen flushed scarlet. And I always remember him telling me that story. She was just so thrilled to get uh, the compliment from her husband, who's normally so brusque and offhand. David Sassoon is one of the world's most admired designers, dressing superstars like Audrey Hepburn, Elizabeth Taylor, and the ladies of the House of Windsor. He's one of the royal family's most trusted dressmakers. When you design for the member of the royal family, they usually have an itinerary of what they're going to be doing in the next few months and what kind of clothes they require. You then submit sketches of the sort of things that you think might be suitable for that particular occasion. It could be a garden party, it could be an opening of Parliament. It could be a very grand ball. One of my first memories of making something for the member of the royal family was Princess Anne. She was eight years old, and she was to be a bridesmaid for the first time. It was very exciting for me because I had only recently come as a student from the Royal College of Art, and suddenly I was going to Buckingham Palace to fit a dress on a royal princess. Designers were tradesmen, so we went to the... And Nanny put Princess Anne into the bridesmaid dress. And then, out of the blue, the Queen appeared. And I walked backwards to make a bow and walked into this corgi bowl full of water, which upset all over my shoes. And the Queen pulled a cord by the side of the fireplace and a liveried page appeared and wiped my shoes. My memory is that the Queen looked at the bridesmaid dress and said, will it wash? She was very concerned that it would, would, would wash. I think the Queen is actually quite thrifty when it comes to her wardrobe. There are occasions when she will rewear something or she will take a dress and team it with a different frock coat or accessorise it and update it. Frugality runs in the family. The Queen's daughter, Princess Anne, is the ultimate thrifty royal. She has worn this cream and navy coat repeatedly over the last 35 years. Working with her dressmakers, the Queen knows what it takes to be perfectly presented. You do give them alternatives. You show them a selection of fabrics to choose from, and then they would say, well, I rather like red, and you might suggest a, a softer red rather than a bright red. So together, 
you work with the member of the royal family on what the final garment is going to be. She's very good at sitting, knowing what to do, you know, to smooth things out as she sits down, which is very important. We used to use a lot of silk, which actually you had to be very careful with. It was called zibeline. And if you folded it across the fabric, it was fine. If you folded it the other way, it cracked. She's got her kit, as it were. She's got her working clothes. She can outdazzle everybody with her diamonds. Hello. And there's a lot of them. I think she sees it as her working wardrobe. And I imagine when she comes back from some gala or reception, she probably takes the tiara off, kicks off her shoes, and relaxes in a dressing gown, like any normal woman would do. When meeting foreign dignitaries, what the Queen wears can sometimes have special significance. In 1983, during a visit to the 20th Century Fox Film Studios in LA, she wore a gown emblazoned with the California poppy. You know, she calls them her costumes. Which costume will I wear today? She's dressing up and going out onto the world stage to perform her duty. The state visit to Ireland in 2011 was a hugely important moment in relations between the two countries. By wearing designs reflecting national colours and symbols, the Queen dresses for diplomacy. When she had the state dinner, the shamrock was embroidered within her gown because it's a business. The bodice and sleeves of the Queen's white silk dress were adorned with over 2,000 hand-sewn embroidered shamrocks. While a Swarovski embellished Irish... They are very much functional business dresses and they are paid for by the Foreign Office because the Queen, as head of state, is representing her country and this is a work outfit. The Queen has created a very specific look with a very strict code. What I admire about Her Majesty the Queen, she's found a formula that works and she's stuck with it and she looks great. Yet even the Queen couldn't compete with one woman. Diana could have worn a plastic sack and looked great. The press immediately called it the black dress. It caused a bit of a stir. That, I think, was the moment that the world woke up and thought, wow, look at Lady Diana. And we reveal how Diana had her very own pretty woman moment. During her lifetime, Princess Diana was the most photographed woman in the world and a style icon. She wore whatever suited the occasion and she had that uncanny knack of always getting it right. Diana could have worn a plastic sack and looked great. She developed a style that was very much her own. She was blessed with a wonderful complexion and she could wear any colour and make it look absolutely wonderful on her. In her earlier days, Diana's clothing confidence was not immediately apparent. When she was Lady Diana Spencer and she was teaching little children in nursery, she was not this powerhouse of fashion. She was pretty demure. I wouldn't say fashion forward in any way. I mean, so much so that that very first picture of Diana that was taken of her holding a child outside the nursery, she was photographed in a completely see-through skirt, you know, much to her horror. That was how sort of naive, I suppose, Diana was when it came to her fashion choices. David Sassoon has dressed the world's most glamorous women. Who better to transform the young lady Di into a princess? Initially, when we first started making clothes for Diana, she was very insecure about the kind of clothes that she would need to wear. So we did very much, at the early stages, guide her through was not always a very easy task for her. Diana's royal fashion journey began in early 1981, when the shy teenager was looking for the perfect outfit to announce her engagement. Diana and David hadn't met yet, but she knew she wanted a Belleville Sassoon piece. The shopping trip didn't quite go to plan. Princess Diana came to our shop one evening about five o'clock, and she was met by a rather intimate dating vendeurs who asked her what she was looking for and Diana just suggested it might be a good idea if she went to Harrods. When my partner and Belinda Belville and I heard, we were absolutely horrified to discover that she didn't recognise Lady Diana and suggested that she went to Harrods for the outfit. It then turned out was the one that Diana would wear for the official photographs with Prince Charles on the announcement 
element of her engagement. Diana's engagement outfit was, I think, very much what we would expect of a young royal bride to be. She had that beautiful engagement ring, which really was the centerpiece of the day, complimented her eyes, and obviously she chose to reflect that blue in her choice of suit and the frilly white blouse. Very fitting of the time. I'm not sure how comfortable Diana felt in it. Diana told me much, much later she hated the outfit she wore for her engagement photograph in the grounds of Buckingham Palace. She did not look the way that Diana looked ever after. Very glamorous, very chic, everything sewn to fit her body. David Sassoon, however, wasn't the only early influence on the way Diana dressed. With the help of up-and-coming designers, the Emanuels, Diana made quite the entrance onto the social scene. She was introduced to Emanuel, which was my ex-wife and I, uh, via Vogue magazine. Diana had ordered and worn several gowns by us. The black shoulderless ball gown worn at the couple's first engagement together made the world sit up and take notice the minute she got out of the car and as she got out of the car you could you i mean it's white heat every flash in that street went off it was such a statement dress i mean the royals don't usually wear black unless they're in mourning and here was diana going for an evening event in a stunning black floor-length gown taffeta silk off the shoulder two quite big things in terms of royal dress statements and this was too big ticks from the fashion brigade. That, I think, was the moment that the world woke up and thought, wow, look at Lady Diana. The press immediately called it the black dress. It caused, I think, a bit of a stir, because the very next morning, the press office from Buckingham Palace rang me and said, Mr Emanuel, you're responsible for the gown. Uh, yes, well, the world wants to know. Royal wedding mania swept the country as Diana was set to marry her prince. We knew the date, the time and the place. But what we didn't know was what the bride would be wearing and who would design it. Diana called my student, asked, would we do her the honour of making her wedding gown? It was a simple phone call. And, of course, immediately that changed my world. I'm very happy and delighted, obviously, with the news. And what about you, Elizabeth? Over the moon. Very thrilled. And how did you celebrate when you heard? We celebrated upstairs in the workroom with all the girls, all the ladies who work for us. We all opened some champagne. It was marvellous. They were thrilled, of course, like we all are. Dreams, but one which the whole world would remember. At one of the fittings, I think we came out with, oh, we want to make you look like a fairy tale princess. And I think that kind of, that banner's stuck, I think. Uh, you have to remember, she was ravishingly beautiful, tall and slim. So we promised to make her like a fairy tale princess. Diana's dress had become one of the most closely guarded secrets in fashion history. As with all royal weddings, it was always going to be about the dress. I know these wedding dresses become iconic parts of royal history. Diana wanted it to be a complete surprise so that when she emerged from her golden coach, that was the first the public, the world, and of course her future husband had seen of this, of this momentous dress, which had been kept as secret as any state secret, it's got to be said. The Emanuels went to extraordinary lengths to keep Diana's dress under wraps. So regarding her fabric, we decided on a very heavyweight silk taffeta, and we asked the weavers to do a whole bolt in white and a whole bolt in ivory because we didn't want them to know which colour we were going to use. Because we promised to keep, like every bride, we promised to keep it a secret because that's the big reveal. One of the biggest secrets was the length of the train. Both Diana and the Emanuels were determined it would make a huge impact. We looked at past royal brides, and I think the longest train in, in royal history was 20 foot. And I remember giggling to Diana, I said, darling, come on, it's St Paul's, it's vast, let's make it bigger. So we had a little giggle about it, and we made it 25 foot. I think it's the longest train in the history of royal wedding dresses. <laughs> The 29th of July, 1981. As huge crowds gathered on the mall to watch the royal procession, a few lucky palace insiders got a sneak preview of Diana's wedding dress. I remember on her wedding day, waiting for the queen to come through, and all I could see was this vision in white running towards me. She had rolled up the train into a ball, pushed it under her arm, and she was running down the corridor like a galleon in full sail. As Diana made her way to St Paul's Cathedral, the world got their first glimpse of her and the dress. And so Lady Diana, in that truly stunning dress, is well and truly launched on her way to the cathedral. Because this is the moment where she could exercise that traditional bride's prerogative of...
late, but somehow I don't think she will. Finally, the moment everyone had been waiting for. There was a collective gasp. It was like, oh, wow, this is what we've been waiting for, and Diana didn't disappoint. She never did when it came to fashion. I certainly remember her getting out of the carriage and thinking, Ugh. it was totally creased. And then watching David Emmanuel as he bends down, he pulls it down. Oh, princess dress. It really was. I don't think anything will ever come close, ever. And it was one of those dresses, you just remember Diana's wedding dress. It was so 80s and it's kind of poofiness and all the yards of the train and the big, beautiful, scrumpled material and her beautiful kind of Spencer tiara. It was like a fairy tale that had come to life. As she walked down the aisle, the congregation were able to appreciate her ivory silk taffeta and antique lace gown, complete with a veil made from 153 yards of tulle. And then the whole dress was fairy tale. I mean, it was Princess Cinderella on speed. I mean, it really was the most amazing outfit. And so she just looked regal. The other extraordinary feature of Diana's dress, the 10,000 pearls used by the designers. On the neckline, on the sleeves, it was all beautifully embroidered with pearls and sequins, with a vast crinoline petticoat, and then the huge cathedral veil in tulle, which was hand-sprinkled with mother-of-pearl sequins. So when she walked down the aisle, it's important, it just twinkled. I think that it was part of this very, you know, Cinderella, like very ostentatious dress, which I think for many people, certainly for many young girls, would have been the dress of dreams. The wedding was watched by more than 750 million people around the world. The Emmanuels became household names. When you've had this world acclaim with this beautiful, ravishing bride, you think, you can't outdo this. But of course, as a design, you've got to go on. So you feel very blessed. Diana had to go on too. She would soon rule the fashion world. She ditched the ruffles and the bows and opted for a more streamlined look. I think she made the queen and the court aware that keeping up with fashion trends can be quite important to make them more relatable to the people. And she even turned her hand to design. It was the only time that she ever independently designed a dress that she would like us to have made. I didn't think it was one of the most successful dresses we have ever made for her. She almost like weaponized the way she looked because she was saying to the world, he cheated on me. Look what he was missing out on. As her confidence grew, Diana stunned us with some of the most iconic looks of the 80s. Princess Diana had a very romantic approach to fashion. She liked pretty clothes initially, but she did change. She learned to be very stylish and very sophisticated. Diana was very good at suggesting a hat and fur muff. She looked very likely she'd walked out of a Dr. Zhivago film, and that was a very successful outfit. And it caused a whole fashion trend suddenly of people having muffs again. I think she made the Queen and the court aware that keeping up with fashion trends can be quite important to make them more relatable to the people. Designers loved every minute of working with the princess. She was such fun to work with. You know, there's delicious blue eyes, and she had a wit and she had humour. She drank on the Monday and said, please, 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 I need something for Friday. You know, you sometimes have to turn it around pretty swiftly. And she said, I know you're terribly busy. And I said, yep, you'd move mountains for her, because she was just so lovely. Creating a look was one thing, but creating a dress was another. As Diana discovered, when she required a gown to attend her first state opening of Parliament in 1981. We were asked to design a very important dress for the state opening of Parliament. And Princess Diana sent us a sketch of what she thought the dress should look like. So we redrew the dress and worked out practically how it was going to work. And it was the only time that she ever independently designed a dress that she would like us to have made. It had a satin bodice, white organza, embroidered with little silver trees dotted all over it and on the actual puff sleeves. I didn't think it was one of the most successful dresses we have ever made for her, and I don't think she felt in the long run it was quite as good as it could have been. Everything Diana wore at home and abroad was poured over. On royal tours and formal 
occasions, everything had to be perfect. If you're dressing abroad, particularly for a foreign tour, you've got to do your research. It is a huge responsibility. And the other thing to remember, it's going to be watched and scrutinized by billions of people around the world. Wherever she went in the world, what Diana wore was headline news. And tonight's bare-shouldered dress showed a very sunburned neck. I was very proud of this particular dress because Princess Diana wore this to the opening of the Barbican. And this she's put at the top, yes, please. It was in burgundy tafta with a ruffled sleeve with a little bit of white lace poking out and a little square neckline. It was an empire shape because she was quite heavily pregnant then but she looked absolutely enchanting. Throughout the 1980s, the princess's style continued to evolve. She took a very lovely diamond and emerald necklace and she wore it as a headpiece and it looked amazing. I mean, I'm not quite sure how she managed to fasten it at the back of her head, but she obviously did and it looked fantastic. The princess always remembered to thank the designers. To Australia, dear David, thank you so much for making me two wonderful dresses to wear on my trip abroad with love from Diana. In 1985, the Prince and Princess of Wales visited America. And at a dinner in the White House, Diana dazzled the world with an iconic gown, the perfect moment in the perfect dress. I think the most standout gown of all for me, because I was there, was when she went to Washington with the Prince of Wales and went to dinner at the White House with Nancy and Ronald Reagan. And she wore that amazing, inky, blue-black velvet dress, which was designed by Victor Edelstein, who's now an artist. But he was very much a, a, a hot designer of the 80s. But we were all penned outside. The room and as each major movie star came in you know, people were throwing questions at them john are you going to uh, dance with the princess tonight i should like you to when john travolta came out he was absolutely charming and he said yes i danced with the princess of wales and we didn't know he was twirling her around the whole trip was tied in with showing off the best of british so diana did really pull out the stops with her wardrobe for that trip As Diana became bolder, so did her fashion choices. She became a royal style rebel. Diana, over the years, learned to break the rules. Diana was one of the first to wear trousers on an official visit. She was the first to stop wearing hats with every occasion. It was tradition for royal women to wear gloves, but Princess Diana put her own spin on it when accessorizing a 1980s Bruce Oldfield power frock at the America's Cup Ball in 86. She wore one black glove and one red glove, but her hairdresser at the time was someone called Richard Dalton, and he used to actually help her with choosing things. So the, these little touches were usually a combination of Diana and probably her dresser. I think it's fair to say that Diana took the royal rule book when it came to royal dressing and ripped it up and started again. She loved fashion and she wasn't afraid to experiment as well. Diana knew the power of wearing the right dress at the right time. In June 1994, she attended a charity event in what would become one of the most talked about dresses she ever wore. That night, a documentary was due to air on TV that would shock the world. The Prince of Wales had decided to tell the world that he committed adultery with Camilla Parker Bowles on national television. And the night that was broadcast, the princess was to attend the Serpentine Gallery for her friend, Lord Palumbo. Carlos has just said, and anyway, I haven't got anything to wear. So I said, yes, of course you've got something to wear. She said, well, go and find me something then. So I went to her wardrobe room and I pulled out the Christina Stambolian dress and showed it to her. She said, I can't even fit into it now. I said, try it on. So she slipped into it. I zipped her up and she looked a million dollars. Diana had bought the dress three years before. Worried it was too daring, she kept it in her wardrobe. That night seemed the perfect time to wear it. That image of Diana in that dress was splashed all over the papers. The Christina Stambolian little black dress became known as the revenge dress. She almost like weaponized the way she looked because she was saying to the world, he cheated on me. Look what he was missing out on. I think 
an absolute two fingers up to him. You know, it was saying, I'm in charge. I'm the one that gets the attention, not you. I am now on the stage. Goodbye, Charles. When her divorce from Prince Charles was finalized in 1996, a new Diana emerged. The hemlines were higher and so were the heels. She was allowed to wear clothes that weren't necessarily by British designers. The world in terms of fashion was completely open to her. She could do what she wanted. One of the first things she did was start wearing high heels. She generally only wore flats around Prince Charles because they were approximately the same height. So for her to be able to wear heels was one of those big moments actually saying, the royal rules don't apply to me anymore. Her skirts were shorter, her clothes became much more overtly sexy, and she really came into her own as a very glamorous, starry princess. Diana's royal wardrobe was bulging with glorious gowns. So in 1997, it was time to have a clear out. Once again, Diana broke with tradition and sold off some of her most beautiful dresses. There can rarely have been an event quite like it, a second-hand clothes sale that had caught the attention of the world. In consultation with William, uh, he said, Mummy, why don't you sell all your dresses for charity? So she said, William, that's a great idea. At $65,000 for you, sir. The clothes that represented much of the princess's married life were disappearing under the hammer each one with its own fans, its own bidders. The dresses raised nearly three million pounds for charity. The famous White House gown broke records and sold for 240,000 pounds. The lasting memory was the very last lot. She nearly didn't sell. She said, I think I'll keep this one because I felt every inch a princess when I was wearing this. But then if we let it go, maybe someone could get married in it one day bring them happiness. Diana paved the way for the royal women that followed her. The royal fashion, and I think when you look at the Duchesses of Sussex and Cambridge, I think Diana did very much pave the way for individuality within the parameters of royal dressing. Diana led the way in the style states, but there's nothing like a royal wedding to really capture the imagination. Of course, it's all about the bride and the dress. We had a lot of fun, and, and she actually wanted to put in a, a Pegasus horse, which I thought, well, how am I going to put that in? The big story here was breaking with British tradition. Said by Queen Victoria, as you know, everything should be British. While it's now traditional for royal brides to wear white, when Queen Victoria married Prince Albert in 1840, her choice was considered a departure from the usual brighter colours. Queen Victoria actually set the standard. She did choose a very simple but fashionable white silk satin court dress. She wanted British fabrics and British manufacturing to support the industry. Over 200 workers were employed to make the Devon lace that adorned the shoulders and sleeves at a cost of around £450 approximately £50,000 in today's money. When the Queen's upcoming wedding to Prince Philip was announced, the country was in the grip of post-war austerity. The government granted the Queen and her designer Norman Hartnell 200 extra ration coupons for the gown. The great British public were also determined to help. These were austere times. Could you imagine there was clothing coupons and the public feeling a huge sympathy for the Queen sent in their coupons, but the palace quite rightly returned all their coupons and sent them back. So I don't know how to this day Hartnell pulled it off, but Hartnell's gown was made of ivory duchess satin, and it was actually inspired by the image Primavera by Botticelli. I mean, divine. By the time it was announced the Queen's younger sister, Margaret, would marry society photographer Anthony Armstrong Jones, times had changed. In 1960, austerity was out, celebrity glamour was in. Princess Margaret was, you know, very much a style icon and transgressed from royalty to celebrity. She would pour over magazines and ordering clothes from, from international couturiers and designers. Despite the princess's love of international fashion, she turned to the family favourite, Norman Hartnell. Princess Margaret is absolutely definitely my all-time favourite. I thought she looked incredible on 
The silk organza dress, the high neck, the long sleeve, the styling, the fitted into the waist, the beautiful full skirt. She just looked glamorous and quite magnificent. The hair was swept up into a huge diamond tiara. Her long tulle veil was edged in satin, was actually made in Paris. She looked like a movie star. In the early 1970s, it was the turn of Princess Anne to walk down the aisle as she married Captain Mark Phillips. The moment we've all been waiting for, and how lovely she looks. Now, we expected something quite different, and we certainly got it today. She took a different path from previous royal brides. Princess Anne changes the mould here. Instead of a couturier, she chose Maureen Baker, a ready-to-wear designer for the company Susan Small. I spoke to Maureen, and she told me literally the company Susan Small gave her a room and said, get on with it. I think that's Princess Anne's personality. She's, you know, going to do things her way and her style, and I don't think that's following necessarily the sort of trend of slightly uh, better-known designers and more of a glamorous style. She likes to keep a very conservative, straight look, and I think that came very much through in her wedding dress. She looks absolutely marvellous. Nearly a decade after Princess Anne's wedding, Diana's dress would set a new bar for royal brides. Sarah Ferguson would have a lot to live up to when she married Prince Andrew in 1986. Sarah Ferguson was completely lacking in style. She's just one of those people that did not have a very good dress taste, as Diana was one of those people that had the most brilliant taste. Fergie appointed British couturier Lind Kachirak to design her wedding dress. At that time, she was having a really hard time with the press for wearing this or looking like that or whatever. And I just thought, OK, shut that all out and we just focus on beautiful you and, and creating something that would be actually her. The pattern book that contains all the original drawings for Fergie's dress still occupies pride of place in Linka's studio. The heavily embroidered design incorporated very personal details. This was the original sort of sketch and the working drawings for all the beadwork. It shows quite clearly the thistles, bumblebees, bows with the S's on the end, which is all part of Sarah's coat of arms. Into the wedding dress, I wanted to bring in the joint aspect of Sarah and Andrew getting married. Andrew brought the navy into the wedding dress through the anchors and hearts and waves and Sarah brought her coat of arms in. So we had a lot of fun, and, and she actually wanted to put in a, a Pegasus horse, which I thought, well, how am I going to put that in? And then she also wanted to put in a helicopter, because at that time she was flying helis. So still keeps the original toil, or mock-up of Fergie's wedding dress in her studio. The first time we ever put it on her, with the actual shaping correct, um, neckline to be decided, height and depth, but also to look at the beading. And in fact, when I saw this on her, I realized that this area was far too complicated, the central part. So I refined that to be much, much simpler and um, have more of an impact. It was just too busy. Lindka simplified some aspects of the design, but the detailed embroidery and beadwork would still set a new benchmark for intricacy. In the dress, in total, I used 120 metres of fabric. There were 220 hours of beading, and the train had 130,060 beads in it. The total, including the bodice, was 153,760 beads, pearls, diamonds, you name it. Amazing. On the big day, huge crowds gathered in central London for Sarah Ferguson and Prince Andrew's wedding. A steadying hand and a first full view of the dress and the bride in all her beauty. As Fergie stepped out of her carriage, Lindka, seen in the white jacket, was on hand to adjust her train. What would the waiting world make of her design? There was a lot going on, but it was a beautiful, beautiful dress and, and she's ne she never looked better than on her wedding day. Fergie did silence her critics. I think every man in the land said, I'd be happy to have that girl on my arm. What was very important is that she had something that was timeless, and well, actually the shoulders are quite big because that was so much the fashion in the 80s. But generally, it's a timeless uh, dress that would stand her beautifully forever. The 1980s were a golden era 
royal wedding dresses. Three decades on, Diana's two sons, Harry and William, would also walk up the aisle. If you look at the Duchess of Cambridge, she's constantly being compared to Diana. Diana was such an icon to live up to. They were such big footsteps for Kate to be filling. But ever since the death of Diana, the, the press, the media have been looking for the next global royal fashion icon. And I suppose that's fallen to Kate and, and now to the Duchess of Sussex as well. After William and Kate announced their engagement, speculation was rife about who she would choose to design her dress. Many expected Kate to make a safe choice. Kate comes from wellies. She wears quite traditional clothing, elegant, tailored, not showing too much flesh. Like Diana, Kate was keen to promote British fashion, but her choice of labels surprised many. Alexander McQueen was the bad boy of British fashion. After his death in February 2010, his number two, Sarah Burton, was chosen by Kate to design her dress. In fashion circles, that was a kind of like, oh my God, because, you know, Lee McQueen in his lifetime was not a traditionalist in the slightest. He was a working class from the East End. So we would expect to see a much more traditional designer, or a much more conservative. Kate tried to keep her choice of design house a secret, but the national press got wind of the story. Behind the scenes, I think that caused tears at the palace because Kate had done everything she possibly could to keep the wedding dress a secret. While the McQueen label was known for its outrageous bold designs, they also had a reputation for exquisite tailoring had a very specific look in mind. Kate had apparently been to see a Grace Kelly exhibition at the Victoria and Albert Museum. She told Sarah Burton that she wanted to emulate Grace, who was obviously a huge icon in the 1950s. When the big day finally arrived, Sarah Burton's creation was revealed. Kate looked stunning in an ivory gown with a satin bodice. The veil was held in place with a tiara borrowed from the Everybody loved Kate's dress. The excitement, that moment that uh, she stepped out, it was wow, incredible. She looked sensational. Even now, it gives me butterflies. I absolutely adore what Kate wore on her wedding day. I love the fact that the dress was so strong, so tailored, and it had that delicate lace throughout as well. The bodice seemed to be exquisitely fitted to her. Formal, a little bit of her personality kind of shining through with the tiara as well. In combination, she looked flawless. The shape of Kate's bodice was inspired by Victorian corsetry, a hallmark of Alexander McQueen. Floral motifs cut from lace were appliqued onto silk net by workers from the Royal School of Needlework. That beautiful lace that had the symbols of the four countries of the United Kingdom, the rose for England, the thistle for Scotland, the shamrock for Ireland, and the daffodil for Wales, embroidered on that beautiful bodice and over the skirt. It was absolutely stunning, and the work in it was beautiful. In 2017, Meghan and Harry were next British couture. Meghan appointed French fashion house Givenchy to make her dress. The label is headed up by British designer Claire Waite Keller, but for some it was still a controversial choice. To me, the big story here was breaking with British tradition. Said by Queen Victoria, as you know, everything should be British. I think with Meghan, she's just, she's so modern and fresh, and I think that was part of what she wanted to be. He really wanted to represent her. I wanted her to feel absolutely incredible in the dress, and also I wanted her to feel like it was absolutely right for the occasion too. Like Kate, Meghan sought fashion inspiration from her favourite Hollywood style icon. Meghan has been a huge Audrey Hepburn fan since she was a child, so it is unsurprising really that she chose to go for Givenchy, who was Audrey Hepburn's favourite designer. It was like, of course, who else would she have gone for? May 2018. When Meghan emerged from her limousine onto the steps of St. George's Chapel in Windsor, the watching world was stunned by the simplicity of her Givenchy gown. The dress is perfect from the moment she gets 
out of that car and walks up the steps into Windsor Chapel. It's simplicity itself, and there's just six scenes. There's a boat neck, very, very relaxed. We're talking about a very sophisticated, chic older bride, glossy, chic understated. So it was refreshingly simple. Opinion was divided, though. Some fashion experts think Meghan's dress took simplicity too far. I, of course, that it really was a shame that there was no question it was a little too big for her. So they didn't get the perfect cut and all fit. And that was a shame. I wasn't like, oh, wow, this dress is amazing. In fact, I was a bit uninspired by it. Just as a dress, I just thought, nah, it's not done it for me. I found it too plain. When it comes to royal wedding dresses, even simplicity comes with a huge price tag. There have been all sorts of figures thrown at the cost of the Duchess's wedding dress, anything from 180,000 up to about a quarter of a million. It does seem like an obscene amount of money, but the hours of labor that go into making that dress, when you're going to the head of an international fashion house, it's going to cost. With such scrutiny also comes criticism. And while some royal women seem to be getting it right, others are accused of fashion fails. People couldn't decide whether it looked like an octopus, a loose eat, or a pretzel. All the negative attention ended up being on poor Beatrice and her hat. While the eyes of the world are on Meghan and Kate, another royal who has learned how to dress for the occasion is Camilla Parker Bowles. When she married Prince Charles, she was widely lauded for her understated style. Dressing Camilla for her wedding day was a pretty tricky feat. She wasn't a young bride getting married. This was second time round. And actually, I think she got the tone just right on her wedding day. She wore this gorgeous sort of dove grey embroidered Anna Valentine coat dress all the way to the floor, paired it with this really fun Philip Treacy um, spray hairpiece. I mean, the colours looked great. Again, very classy, very put together. Roy Allen has been dressing Camilla for the past 14 years. I often stick to a certain shape with her, with um, it's just trying to do something different with it because I like to give her a waist, you know, and more shape and that in it. Like all members of the royal family, the Duchess of Cornwall requires a wardrobe for official engagements. I did have one outfit once where she wanted an outfit for um, one of the tours they were doing. It was only a week before and she decided she needed another dress and coat. And she wanted it in blue and I said, well, what am I going to do? And she said, oh, I trust Mr Roy to get the colour and everything and the style. I don't need to see a drawing of it or anything. So I did had one fitting that week and finished it for her for the end of the week to take away with her. Because <laughs> it's very important you get things done early for them because they all have to be loaded into the plane and things the day before. So it's very important that you, um, you're not late. I think Camilla's style is classic. She is a classic, good, plain dresser. She, like Kate, is, is much happier in jeans and wellies playing with her grandchildren and dogs than she is in posh frocks. She wears very elegant clothes. But obviously she is of a certain age, so she's not going to show her legs off in public or flash the flesh. Camilla knows what she likes and what suits her. Sometimes I think I'd like to do a different shape, but she loves the shapes I do. So, <laughs> Like a lot of people, she sticks to the things that she knows suit her. And that's what every woman should do, really. You shouldn't go by necessary by fashion. You should go by what looks good on you and what makes you feel good. And that's the most important thing, I think. Of the many outfits he's designed for... Miller, Roy has his own personal favourites. This I made early on in my days making for the Duchess. It had these wonderful curved seams that went round and came up the back and curved round again. And that was all hand embroidered, like the sample here. And it had a narrow one at the side of it as well. I had to do a curved zip in it, which I'd never done before. So um, that was quite interesting. I enjoyed making it. It was great fun. This is one I made for one of her trips, which... She liked, and she's worn quite a lot to different things. This was in a lovely purple wool, and it had rows and rows of the pleating around the neck and around the cuffs, so it was very pretty. It was quite popular, and it's been photographed quite a lot. Understated her style may be, but Camilla hasn't gone unnoticed by the fashion world's biggest names. Edward Enfield, who is the new editor of Vogue, adores Camilla, thinks she's the best dressed royal. He thinks she's gorgeous. He wants to put her on the cover of Vogue. I mean, I'd love to see Camilla on the cover of Vogue. I think that would be awesome. The Duchess. 
Cornwall is finally getting some recognition for her fashion. But she's not the only royal who's sometimes underappreciated in the style stakes. I think the one who's not applauded enough is the Countess of Wessex. Sophie Rhys-Jones, Countess of Wessex, I think is one of the best dressed royal women. She is fashion forward without being too out there, without being too outre. It's not ostentatious, it's not full blown, it's very pared down. I often see her at Ascot where she's got it spot on, where so many royals get it wrong. She dresses now better in her 50s than she did when she was in her 30s, which is quite interesting. She's um, more than happy to sort of experiment with patterns and, and fun and flamboyancy. One of Sophie's favourite designers is Amelia Wickstead, and she's worn some stunning Amelia Wickstead dresses in the past. And I remember at the Palace of Versailles, she was wearing this awesome snakeskin, which you wouldn't really expect a royal to wear, but she totally rocked it. She was wearing something that was very fashion forward, but in her way, her style. But there are others who have come in for huge criticism. The worst dresser of all time was definitely Fergie. And she looked great in her own clothes and jeans and T-shirts, but she was just a disaster in the fashion of the 80s because it was too much for her. It was too frilly. There were too many bows. There were too many tweaks. There were too many frills. And she said so herself. So Fergie in the 80s just didn't go together. She actually, I think, as an older woman now, has got her style absolutely on point. She's got really good legs. She always wears dresses or pleated skirts, a top and a blazer. And, you know, she's got that lovely red hair. Learning from the past mistakes of others isn't always easy. In the way that Sarah Ferguson's always had a bit of a bad reputation when it comes to fashion, unfortunately, her daughters haven't escaped that either. I mean, that image of Beatrice in the Philip Tracy hat at the royal wedding in 2011, I think, is one that will forever haunt her. People couldn't decide whether it looked like an octopus, a loose eat, or a pretzel. All the negative attention ended up being on poor Beatrice and her hat. Often with the York sisters, it's a case of trying too hard and feeling that they need to look apart. Well, and actually, when you do see them out and about, um, they look great. I think it's when they're trying to dress up for a big occasion. Even the Queen isn't immune from the odd fashion faux pas. Although they've been few and far between variety performance and she wore this frankly hideous dress. It was bright yellow in the skirts and the top of the dress was in a harlequin print of other vibrant colours. It was just jarring to the eyes to see if I'm honest and not what you usually see from a majesty for an elegant evening occasion. A state banquet in Slovenia was another example of that. Quite a nice silver brocade gown that she was wearing but it was trimmed with fur around the cuffs and the neck. The proportions were just off and it just looked a little bit strange. Um, for, for the time and the occasion. So that was a no from me. With designers on hand to create unique pieces, royal women can be reasonably sure they won't be caught in the same outfit as anyone else, surely. The Queen was looking at a swatch of fabrics uh, with Bobo MacDonald, who was her dresser at the time. And Ian said, Your Majesty, I think that one of my other clients might have that dress. He said, let's have it then. And he said, but, but, but Your Majesty, I don't want to, anyone else to be seen in the same dress. She said, yes, what fun. So he made the dress for her. Much later on, the Queen was telling him a story. She was at Royal Ascot. In those days, they had a house party for the entire week of Ascot. She walked down the stairs wearing this dress. And she looked up, and there was one of her house guests wearing exactly the same dress. And she said to Ian, and guess who had to go and change? So she beetled back upstairs and changed. She found it amusing. It turned into one of the rare occasions the Queen is rumoured to have changed outfits for a guest. The royal family have always had an effect on fashion trends, and that's never been more true than today. The younger royals have become the ultimate fashion influencers. The Kate effect first struck when she wore a £40 dress from Topshop. Literally, the website crashed. Everybody wanted to be seen in that dress.
the royal family have long been considered global fashion icons, from Princess Margaret in the 1950s to Princess Diana, right through to 21st century royals Kate and Meghan. Kate and Meghan are very different. They're very different women and they dress in different ways. I would say that Kate is very much aware that she will be the next Princess of Wales and she will be Queen one day. She's been groomed to be future Queen. Her style is more restrained and more regal than the rest of them. And that's as it should be, because we want to respect our royal family, and Kate is the future. As queen in waiting, Kate has to follow strict protocols. Kate is a big diplomatic dresser, so colours are a big way of doing that. Um, for example, when she first visited Canada in 2011, she distinctly wore a white dress and a red hat, and that red hat had maple leaves on it, so it was a real nod to her host country. Meghan, on the other hand, may have freedom to express herself through fashion. She is the designer duchess through and through. She was a red carpet celebrity before she married into the royal family, so I think fashion is an intrinsic part of her and who she is. There's a lot of Hollywood glamour about Meghan. She knows how to step it up in the glamour stakes, and pregnancy was actually no barrier to Meghan's love of glamour. I call Meghan style very New York, very sassy, very, very cool. I think she looks wonderful in tight trousers, high heels, little jacket. I think that's Meghan's real look, and she's had to adapt herself to more English dressing. What Kate and Meghan do have in common is they mix high street and couture. Well, certainly when Meghan bought a sweater from Marks & Spencer, they sell out. The website usually crashes, sometimes, you know, within, within minutes. So it is a hugely commercially good for the brand which is why we want these royal ladies to wear as much British as they possibly can. I think we love that about Kate, that it's not all high-end. You know, she will dress in L.K. Bennett, she goes to Reese. We do see her in more affordable brands, and I think that's all part of her charm and her appeal. I think the Kate effect first struck when she wore a £40 dress from Topshop. Literally, the website crashed, it sold out overnight, everybody wanted to be seen in that dress. And what was so lovely about it was the fact that it was relatively inexpensive, so people could afford to buy it. It's been estimated. Between them, Kate and Meghan generate £300 million a year in increased sales for designers. Meghan has also become increasingly passionate about to make ethical choices with a lot of the garment that she wears. I think that sustainability is something that is really important to our future within the fashion industry in general. So I think it's brilliant when royals do choose to go for a more sustainable option. She is brought to the world's attention, ethical fashion. The shoes that she wore um, on the tour of the Pacific were made out of recyclable plastic bottles. So she's really putting the attention on that. During Meghan and Harry's 2018 tour of Oceana, the fortunes of one ethical brand that Meghan was photographed wearing were transformed overnight and the lives of the people it employs. The denim that she wore when she was in New Zealand um, and Australia, for example, Outland Denim. It's an ethical fashion company. It employs people who would otherwise have ended up in the sex trafficking industry in Cambodia. It takes them off the streets and gives them a job and gives them a chance of a proper life. So by buying those jeans, they've seen their sales increase and it's given them the ability to hire 15, 20 more women who might otherwise have ended up in the sex trade. So there's a real power to Meghan's dressing. Such is the power of the House of Windsor brand. Kate's children are now making their mark on fashion trends for toddlers. What's fascinating is that the Kate effect has not just extended to her, but to her family. Everything George and Charlotte wears sells out instantly. And it's surprising in some ways because they are wearing quite traditional old-fashioned clothes for children. I think Prince George wore a John Lewis little coat to his first day at nursery up in Norfolk, and then mums everywhere were rushing to go online to buy it. These pictures are going to be looked at for the next 70 or 80 years. I think it's quite clever that she dresses her children in quite a timeless way, because it then means, literally, that what they're wearing won't date.
over the decades, the royals have skillfully used the way they dress to send out a message. Whether it's dressing for diplomacy, a special occasion, or an international tour, reinventing themselves in the eyes of the public, or influencing future trends, what the royals choose to wear will always be watched.